And hello, this is Eamon O'Brien and you're so welcome to the Reluctant Speakers Club Expert Series. And coming up today, we're going to talk about the importance for speakers to put the word heart in the sentence when you want to connect with your audience. And we have some terrific guests in our chair far, far away, actually all the way in California. We have Michael Hulham and we have Bonnie Harvey. Hello, Michael. Hello, Bonnie. Hello, Eamon. Happy to be here. Hello there. Great to have you here. And just by way of backdrop in terms of uh, who you are, for those who don't know, you are the creators of the mega brand Barefoot Wines. You are the authors of a New York Times best-selling book, which is called, get me, I get this right, The Barefoot Spirit. And you're also entrepreneurial cheerleaders, and you are the perfect people to talk about the power of passion and story. Thank yes, you. yes, thank you. Good. Well, speaking of story, maybe we could start with and um, uh, Michael or Bonnie either. How you started, because every story has to have a beginning, and I love this notion of you looking at 18,000 bottles and wondering what we're going to do with them. <laughs> yes, we ended up um, taking on a debt. Um, we were trying to collect funds for a grape grower who wasn't getting paid and the winery was actually going bankrupt that owed him the money. So they were unable to give him any money for this debt, for the grapes that he'd sold them, but they were able to give him bottling services and bulk wine. And that's how we ended up with all of that wine. And yes, we were definitely trying to figure out what to do with it, as neither of us had any experience in the wine industry. But uh, we decided to give it a go. When you were giving it a go, you did something terribly important. You, you uh, tapped straight away into the power of asking people things. Tell me about that. Well, you know, when you get started on a project like that, and you have all these assets, and you have to turn them into cash, uh, and you're, you're faced with this daunting task of, oh, we need a marketing program. Oh, we need a distribution program. Oh, we have to put a label on this. We have to sell this in a supermarket. People have to buy it. So just right there is, is a huge education. So what we did is, I think it's because we didn't know any better, we went out and we asked everybody who touched our product. Everybody that we thought would touch our product. We talked to people on the bottling line. We talked to people who were truckers. We talked to people who uh, we like to say who had dirt under their fingernails. They were driving forklifts, and you know these were people who were putting groceries on the shelves in the supermarkets and pricing them. And they're down on their knees and they're wearing smocks. Because you did you find any surprises in the answers that you were given? Every time. Oh, oh my gosh. Absolutely. We actually uh, redesigned the cartons for our product because a warehouse man told us that he was unable to see what product he was picking up because we had maybe five different products at the time, different varietals of wines, and we were getting missed deliveries. And he said, well, why don't you make every different varietal or every different product you have in a different colored box? Very good advice. It not only stopped our missed deliveries, but it also enabled us to have beautiful displays in the in the stores on the floor. Which is which is wonderful, and I I love the story. And we were talking about it off air about when you were selling things at the outset. Share the story about Piggly Wiggly. I love that. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, you know, this is this is down in the southeastern United States. It's very tropical there. Um, you know, and I, I come from a relatively dry climate, California, so I'm not used to this. I, I'm walking, so, so when you go to a store to make a pitch, out of courtesy, you park on the other side of the parking lot. Because if the owner of the store sees you park right up in front, he's going to be angry with you because you're taking a customer's parking spot. So all salespeople have to park on the other side of the lot. Then you have to walk from your car with your wine or whatever you're selling and all your signs, you know, 100 yards or 100 meters to the store, and uh, then you can make your pitch. Only this one day, I was walking across the, uh, the parking lot, and it was kind of overcast, but it, you know, it didn't look like it was going to rain or anything. And all of a sudden, this guy came running by me, one of those guys that collects the carts, and he was pushing a big roll of carts 
and he goes flying by me and he goes, you better run for it, mister. And I said, what? And I looked around and there wasn't anything happening. And then I heard a clap of thunder and it was like all of a sudden I was standing under Victoria Falls. Oh no. I, mean, I just got soaked from my head in my pockets were filled with water <laughs> uh, and I was holding a large sign and the wind came with this rain and it blew me across the parking lot first one way and then the other and it was all I could do. I knew that if I didn't hold on to this sign and I let go of the sign it was going to go to Georgia. You know, and I was in South Carolina, so I didn't want that to happen. I finally get into the store, and I'm standing there, and all my stuff is soaked, and I'm soaked, and I'm up in the front, and uh, over the loudspeaker comes this announcement. It says, it says, wet mop up front, and, you know, here comes a little clerk, you know, with a bucket and a mop, and so that's how I was <laughs> greeted, and that was one of my first calls, and, and this, this southern gentleman came up to me, and he was the manager, and he says, he says, I'll bet you got something to sell me, boy, and I'll bet you want to sell it real bad. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. Yeah. And but clearly, yeah, was, clearly there was a lot of schlepping things around at the time, which, which suggests that you would have had many, many challenges along the way. I think, Bonnie, I heard you saying it took you 20 years to be an overnight success. Yes. Yes. But that tell takes me about a while. The, the, the kinds of, of the biggest challenges at the outset of growing your business and figuring out your story. Right. Yes, yes. Well, a, a huge challenge that we had was getting the word out about an unknown product. That is definitely challenging. How do you get people to go into the store to buy your product? So we discovered that. Um, around the markets where our product was sold, there was a lot of people that were interested in things besides a fine bottle of wine with a cute foot in it, on it. So we found out what they were interested in, which was cleaning up their neighborhoods, which was supplying after-school parks for their kids, or supporting a local library and things like this. They were community fundraisers. So we started supporting these community fundraisers. And um, we would go and help them set up, and we would talk to their, their participants, their members, about why we were supporting their cause. And we could do something else for them that they were unable to do. We could get the message about their fundraiser in the marketplace. We'd put little tags on our bottle, on the necks of our bottle, and say, Boys and Girls Club is having a fundraiser. Send people there. So that's how we were able to uh, address that challenge. And it worked so well because we didn't have funds for advertising, but this worked so well by supporting our community that we continued to do that. And we did that throughout the nation. And we had tremendous growth, always without paid advertising, but with supporting community fundraisers and nonprofits. And, and do you recall any particular stories when you, you thought, you know what, I think we're on to something here? Well, I can tell you one story that is very interesting. Um, <clears throat> we became uh, big supporters of the Surfrider Foundation. Mm -hmm. Now, the Surfrider Foundation is international now. It's all over the world. But what they do is they clean up beaches and they test the ocean water. Now, the government doesn't test the ocean water. It's these volunteers, the Surfrider Foundation, they test the water for the safety of the children and the people who are immersing themselves in the, in the ocean all day. There's a lot of bacteria there. So I was working in Los Angeles with a salesperson, and he said, you know, Mike, he says, you used to be a surfer when you were going to school in uh, Santa Barbara, California, and you really sh you're really supporting these worthy causes. You should support the Surfrider Foundation. And I said, great, where are they? He says, oh, go down to this little beach town. So I went down there, I'm wearing a suit and tie, and I get to this store, you know, to these stores, and there's one of them that's like, kind of newspapered up and it just has a little sign and it says Surfrider Foundation. So I knock on it and I look in the door and uh, there's a guy sitting there and one of these uh, military surplus desks. He's got a phone in his hand. He's wearing shorts. You know, he has a t-shirt on and he, there's a surfboard on the wall. And I said, is this the Surfrider Foundation? And he says, you found it, international headquarters. So here they were. They just started out. So we just started out. So I said to him, you know, we're here to help you. You know, we'd like to do something. He says, well, he says, we're, you know, we're right now, he says, we're, we need money to buy these test kits 
that, you know, they're like petri dish and you can open them up under the water and then the bacteria that's in the water will light on the dish and by the time it gets to our lab, we'll know where the bacteria came from and what kind of bacteria and we can close the beach or, or close the, the source of the pollution. I said, that's amazing. I said, why don't we do something like this? You guys always say hang 10 on your surfboards. How about this? Hang 10 for clean water. Our customer is a 37-year-old mom with two and a half kids pushing a cart down the aisle at a supermarket. And her kids are spending their time in the ocean. So she has a natural interest in a clean ocean. So why don't we appeal to her? So here, you know, imagine the chutzpah. You don't just go to somebody and say, you know, give me $6 for a bottle of wine. You go and you say, give me $6 for a bottle of wine and then give $10 on top of the $6 to this nonprofit organization to clean up the ocean so your kids don't get infected. And so we did that for them and we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars and we became an ally with them. So, you know, fast forward many years later, I get an opportunity to go into the supermarkets in Florida. And we're not known in Florida, but there's bare footprints all over the beach in Florida. And so I said to the buyer, look, you know, barefoot's gonna be a slam dunk in Florida. You guys are running around barefoot. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a common image here. And uh, we're a big hit in California. He says, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna give you 10 stores. You gotta sell 300 cases in 90 days or you're out of here and you'll never make it into my stores. The guy had 600 stores. So I was just shaking and thinking, what are we going to do? And, you know, Bonnie said, well, you know, we have those guys in Surfrider, and now they've got chapters in Florida. So we went to Florida, and we talked to the Surfriders in Florida, and we said, listen, we'd like to help you like we help you in California with wine donations and, you know, public, public addressing the, the, the market. Um, and, and we'd like to do it here, but we can't do it here unless we have a warehouse here. We can't have a warehouse here unless we have a buyer here. We have a buyer who's giving us a test market here. Here's the 10 stores. What do you think? Well, they sold out. Which is a fantastic story. I love that. Obviously, you really connected with, the, 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 with your target audience. And I suppose, really, what you did is you created evangelists. Or, um, uh, you, you, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we call them advocates. But yeah. Advocates, yeah. yeah. We created advocates and um, I think I think th that the idea is that we created a movement with a wine to go with it. So we didn't really start off, and I guess that's where the heart and the passion comes in, is it's really about the movement, the barefoot movement, which is you know, you want the beach to be clean. You wouldn't want to put your foot in, in polluted water. You know, you step lightly on the land, all of those things. So that kind of gave us, you know, the direction for what kind of groups to support. You know, it's mostly conservation, mm -hmm. you know, and human rights groups. Yeah, and I, I'm, gu I'm guessing that you had uh, challenges along the way because I think the heart element is a very important part of your story, and you see... I love, incidentally, uh, Bonnie, that that's your foot in print that's on the <laughs> bottle, but it is down uh, and personal with your audience. So what were the biggest challenges you faced in terms of getting that connection going? Or uh, did was it basically like Wildflower? It really took years to get going. And what surprised us much, uh, the most when we were starting off is we knew that we had a gold medal winning product, we had an excellent price, we had that really cute foot on the label, so we thought it was just going to sell like hotcakes, and it didn't, and yeah. that really surprised us. We found that we needed to have a representative in every market, so they were paying attention to the distributor, paying attention to the retailer, and paying attention to the community. And nobody would give uh, all those uh, entities that kind of attention unless they were really invested in barefoot sellers, unless they were really a part of our company. So we had to hire our own representative to go out there and give the best service possible to the distributors, the retailers, and to the community. And um, we thought that there would be more support from the distributors and the retailers, and they're it, they required more help than uh, we'd first thought. 
<laughs> that's 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 very, very politic, and I like that a lot, Bonnie, um, because I'm sure that it took a lot of gra a lot of grafting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it took a lot of work. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. That, yeah. But in terms of the uh, of the, the setbacks, you know, you talked about obviously, you know, there's no such thing as getting rich quick, and I like yours, you know, getting rich uh, slow um, uh, mentality, but. Um, <laughs> Of all of the challenges that you learned a great deal from, what would you put top of the list? Well, I would say the biggest challenge that we faced was uh, trying to grow too fast. You know, mm -hmm. you get all excited about your idea. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, traction in the marketplace, you know, and then you get this idea, oh, well, this is going to go. And so you expand it. So... You know, we decided to go to Hawaii because, you know, we thought that was a slam dunk. We thought, gee, Hawaii, why don't you tell that story, Bonnie? What well, happened? there's footprints on all the beaches, of course, and half of the bars and restaurants are called Barefoot. So we thought it was just a real natural there. But Michael discovered that when he was over there that he could sell any store or bar or restaurant that he went into. He wrote with the salesperson that had our product there in, in the islands, and he made wonderful sales. He came back. He was so excited. He was sure that Barefoot was going to be a screaming success in Hawaii, but we didn't get any reorders from the distributorship. It took Michael's presence. He went back there. He got the product back on the shelf. Uh, the retailer didn't reorder it. The salesperson didn't ask for the reorder. In fact, he was happy that we'd sold out on the shelf because then there was an empty space that he could fill up with our competitor's product that was maybe giving him five dollars a box for putting him up there. Or something. Oh, absolutely. So that was that was a real shocker for us and we actually had to pull out of that market uh, until we could afford to hire someone who would be living right there in Hawaii to take care of that market properly. So what we really had was great service. We had a wonderful product um, yes, indeed, we had you know top quality wines, but without the service to uh, the distributor and the retailer and the community, we didn't have anything that was going to be staying on the shelf. We didn't have consistent sales. And that was a huge Absolutely. lesson for us. That comes back full circle, if you like, to the, the power of heart and passion and connection with your audience. And if you were giving, and I'm talking now about people who are building brand and who want to promote that and to want to speak about that. If you want about your story, what would the, the most important bit of advice you would give be? Okay, I think that the word empathy comes to mind more than anything else. You know, when you talk about heart, they say, well, do you have a heart for this person or do you have a heart for this cause or, you know, so you really have to convince the person that you're trying to get to behave a certain way, whether it's to buy your product or buy your brand or put your brand on the shelf or keep it in stock or drive the truck or handle the warehouse or any of those things. They have to believe that you care about them. So the first thing you have to do is put yourself in the other guy's shoes and say, you know, what does this guy want? You know, and what we found was that most of the people between us and the customer didn't care about wine at all. In fact, they didn't care about our price. They didn't care about our taste. They didn't care about our package. They cared about things that were completely different, like the guys who owned the distributorships, they wanted to know if what was the strategic value of having our wine in their warehouse. In other words, were they going to be a big shot with the local supermarket? Did the local supermarket want to buy it before they got it? And would yeah. that give them more importance? So there's a strategic thing. And so once you know what that guy wants, well, then you send your guys to the supermarket, sell the supermarket first. Then you go visit the guy at the distributorship and say, hey, Bill, you know, would you like to have some free money today? <laughs> and, and, Absolutely. So, and I think that therein lies the power and the importance of platform. Exactly. It's, it's all about platform. Um, you have to understand in every business, you have to understand, and this is the biggest mistake people do make, is they fall in love with their product. Yes. And 
you know, and we fell in love with ours. And we say this in, you know, 2020 hindsight, like Monday morning quarterbacks. The fact is, we really didn't know what we were doing. We went out there thinking, well, we've got a great product at a great price. Why won't it sell? And it, where we blew it was we didn't realize all the relationships and all the connections that we had to have to move the product all the way through the system and keep it moving. And every one of those relationships required empathy. Every one of those relationships, you had to know what the other person wanted. And you had to give the other person what they wanted instead of telling them what you're selling. And that was that was a, a humiliating experience at first. <laughs> but after a while, I got to think. Now they're words to live by. Yes, you bet. You bet. And can I thank you for watching today? You have been listening to the Reluctant Speakers Club Expert Series. And until the next time, happy speaking. <laughs>